Dear friends, it is Monday, August 9th, and today starts a brand new sermon series. Actually, yesterday was the start on Sunday, but video-wise, in terms of our video devotionals here at VPC, we start today, and we're going to be looking at four different sections of Scripture, and today we're going to be looking at a famous passage from uh, the 19th chapter of the Book of Kings. And uh, we're going to start with a little background, so I'm going to read to you a little passage about the king in Israel at the time. He, uh, his name was Ahab. Let's listen for the word of the Lord as we find it. 1 Kings 16, verses 29 through 33. This is a little summary of what the king uh, Ahab was like. In the 38th year of King Asa of Judah, so that just so we get the picture, there were two kingdoms. The unified kingdom that we're familiar with under David and Solomon had divided into a northern kingdom, sometimes called Israel or Samaria, and a southern ki kingdom that was centered around Jerusalem and, and the tribe of Judah. And so in the 38th year of King Asa of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. He became king in the north. Ahab, son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years, so over a generation. Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. That's quite a statement, isn't it? I'd you like to have that as your epitaph. Was, was a, a greater evil, evildoer than any leader before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, a previous evil king, he took as his wife Jezebel, daughter of King Ethbal of the Sidonians. So there was an area uh, called Phoenicia, and this was a kingdom within within that called Sidon. And you notice that the um, both these two figures, the father, King Ethbal, B-A-L-L, that's um, the name of the god of that area. In fact, one or more of these gods that had the name Baal were, were, were the fertility gods of this whole area of the ancient Near East, the land of Canaan in the promised land. Men remember Moses said to the people of Israel, you know, watch your faith when you enter the land because you're going to encounter people with, with other kinds of faith. Don't mix with them. Don't marry with them uh, because otherwise you will lose your faith in the context of these other contradictory beliefs. Well, the king, who's supposed to be the model uh, spiritual person in the kingdom of Israel, disobeyed that and took as his wife a follower of Baal, Jezebel, daughter of this uh, Sidonian king, and he went and served Baal, and he worshipped him. He erected uh, an altar for Baal in, in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. So he built a temple to Baal in the northern kingdom. He also made a sacred pole. Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord the God of Israel, than all the kings of Israel who were before him. This is the word of the Lord. Well, friends, um, this is a background of the story of Elijah, and I, I share it because Elijah was called to call Israel back to faithfulness. The people had fallen into um, what the, the, the historians of religion call syncretism, which is essentially getting everything mixed up together. And it's a huge tendency in our culture today for us to believe, because the market is the dominant uh, form of life in Western civilization. It's kind of the atmosphere that we're in. We, we learn how to be consumers. We learn how to have a lifestyle. We learn how to shop and do comparative shopping and how to invest and how to provide security for ourselves in the future. And, um, these are skills that apply to a situation where the market is, is prevalent. Um, and um, the, uh, this is relevant to our uh, story today because there was also a, um, a kind of a market in this ancient world. It was an agricultural world and it depended on the um, the idea that the crops would grow if they had the proper amount of rain, if the weather cooperated. And so these ball, these ball gods, particularly the lead god, were gods which were essentially weather gods. They provided 
the weather element in the system that will allow agriculture to succeed. They're, they're often referred to as fertility go uh, gods. And in this land of Canaan, there was kind of a syncretistic, open-ended approach to worshiping these fertility gods. And they associated the fertility of the soil with the fertility of the womb, with being fertile in the sense of being able to have children. And so these gods also were, were seen as a vehicle for, in a sense, financial success and personal control of your life. By propitiating or appeasing these gods, and you did that in rituals and rites, sometimes with human sacrifices, you could guarantee, as it were, that you'd have a measure of uh, control over the level of success in your life, measured both economically and personally. And so these gods were very attractive to the rulers of Israel because uh, it's a nice thing as a politician if you can promise your people that their basic needs and desires are going to be met. And if you're going to offer them a god who essentially affirms your desires and validates your pleasures and really doesn't make any moral demands on you and also doesn't require any ultimate loyalty, it makes the religious life seem initially very simple. It's also very shallow. In contrast, Yahweh is not a god that's anything like the fertility gods. He is, first of all, a moral god who enters into covenant with the people of Israel. And part of that covenant is a set of commandments about how to live their lives in relationship with him and with one another. The chief rule in relationship to life with God is you'll have no other gods. It's a, an, an, a, a rule that's against syncretism. And so right away there's a clash there. Uh, Yahweh doesn't permit other relationships, his exclusive relationship of love with him. Since he is the one true God and creator of the universe, he doesn't want us to be diverted toward gods that are not real gods, that are idols. And indeed, just then as now, success, personal control over your life can become idols. So you invest most of your time and energy in those activities. And anything you develop most, you, you devote most of your time and energy and your thoughts toward becomes your God. It becomes an idol to you. So that's the background to this um, story. And so we know that Elijah, who is the, the prophet that God is going to call, had a very hard job to dislodge this syncretism, which not only was a practice that was going on among the people in Israel, but now was the official approach of the king, who was radicalized by marrying a, a, a promoter of Baal, and who not only wanted to embrace the Baal religion in addition to, to the to the worship of Yahweh, but in effect became someone who wanted to eliminate the worship of Yahweh by killing its priests. And it was into that situation that um, Elijah was called. And so the story of his call is in a few verses in 1 Kings 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these days, these years, except by my word. What a claim. I'm going to control the weather, and as long as you're unfaithful to Yahweh, it's never going to rain. Uh, and then God warned him that the king was going to, that challenging the king is a dangerous thing to do. He says, go from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the Wadi Cherith, east of the Jordan. So he crossed the Jordan River into the eastern area, and he hid from the king and lived kind of a, a, a hermit-like life for a while. And then when word got back to the king that where he was hiding, he moved on further into the territory of the Phoenicians. And he lived with a widow in a place called Zarephath. He was miraculously uh, maintained in both of these uh, situations. One of the issues raised by this first part of the story is the issue of legitimacy. When is a government or a king legitimate? And in terms of ancient Israel's theology of power, when a king began to uh, lose his faith or push the people of Israel toward the worship of false gods, he became illegitimate. He lost his legitimacy as a ruler. Teddy, today we tend to think of legitimacy in terms of someone who is, uh, whose rule is the result of a legitimate process, a democratic process, where people uh, give their consent to that person's rule. There's a vote that takes place, and so it's, um, 
there's a there's a measure of public support for the person in in authority, and indeed we're we're called to be loyal oppositions when our candidates don't win to still give some respect to the office that the person we didn't vote for holds because otherwise if we spend all our time attacking one another the whole idea of of a legitimate democratic uh, order disintegrates and nobody has any legitimacy and if you don't have legitimacy it's a hard thing to rule so to come back to ancient Israel the challenge of, of Elisha was that he was challenging the legitimacy of the rule of the king. And um, that's the setting we're in here on this first day of the week. Let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the courage of Elijah, the amazing courage, announcing judgment in the form of a drought that lasted for three years. And uh, we pray that when you call us to stand up before authorities, uh, before bosses, before people who have influence over us within the hierarchies of life, that you will help us to have that same courage and honesty that he had, and to be loyal to our faith in every setting in which we are living. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.